I'm a local rookie cop in a, a small town in Pennsylvania, currently stuck working night shift. I work the normal patrol shift, uh, driving around, pulling traffic, responding to your normal domestic disputes and whatever other wonderful calls dispatch sends my way. But ever since this past weekend, every single night, I kept getting called to this same house. At first, I thought it was my co-workers just playing pranks on the rookie. I mean, I have two years on the job, but in such a small town, I worked with most guys my dad's age. I've omitted certain names and addresses for obvious reasons, but here's what happened. So Friday night around 0200 hours, actually Saturday morning really, a dispatch gets over the radio. Dispatch to 1034? Uh, 1034, go ahead. Hey, uh, we just got a 911 hang up from a, a landline that's coming back to Patch Lane, I think. Can you go and check it out? Uh, 10 4 en route. So, I immediately start driving to the address, which was about six miles away, I think, but it's a pretty rural area, so I get there in less than 10 minutes. I turn right onto the gravel lane, and after about seven seconds, I see the house up ahead on the right. No lights on inside. I park my cruiser on the gravel lane, lights off, so as not to announce myself in case there is an actual emergency going on inside. We're trained not to just roll up to a house, lights on in case the subject decides to ambush the officers arriving with gunfire or something. Anyway, I quietly approach the old farmhouse and check the perimeter. There's no signs of anything. No lights, no sound, not even a park parked anywhere. I begin to think that maybe dispatch got the address wrong. Uh, 1034 to dispatch. Dispatch, go ahead. Hey, uh, I'm at Patch Lane, and can you confirm that this is the actual address? Uh, yeah, stand by. Uh, 1034, yeah, that's the correct address. Uh, do you need backup? Uh, negative. Uh, it appears nobody's home, but I'll update, okay? At this point, I knock on the front door and announce myself. Uh, hello? My name's Officer Barkley. I'm from the police department. But there's no answer. And all the windows were closed, so I gently try the front door and it's locked. 10.30 to dispatch. A dispatch, go ahead. It looks like the house is abandoned. I think the 911 hang-up might have just been some crosswires or something. Uh, clear me no report. 10-4. At this point, it's about 0230 hours and, man, do I need a cup of coffee since I have another three and a half hours left on my shift. I head over to the local 24-hour gas station and find two of my ever-so-busy co-workers standing there fueling up on caffeine as well. They grin and ask if I had fun responding to the old doc's house. Clearly. I must have had a dumb look on my face showing the confusion I was feeling because then he goes... You don't know, do ya? He continues. That old farmhouse over there? It belonged to Dr. Wentz. He was the guy that I'm sure you've heard about. He used to do the botched abortions and all sorts of inhumane procedures back in the 1800s. He's the guy all the rich went to when they had young daughters getting knocked up or when they had a special needs child that they didn't want to keep. He actually built that house himself and even named the road Patch Lane as a joke to all of the patching that he did for people. I finished my coffee, laughing about the old tale the guys were trying to pull on me. I wasn't going to let these guys spook me, especially being that I was one of the only females on the department and I have to have skin twice as thick. So, I finish up my shift, get some Z's and back in I go on Saturday morning. Around the same time, maybe a little later, around 0230 hours, I get the call. A dispatch to 1034? 1034, go ahead. Uh, we got another 911 hang up from the same number as last night. But this time, they actually stayed on the line and we could hear someone talking but couldn't make it out. Can you go check it out again? Uh, can you confirm the address again? Yeah, sure. It comes back to Patch Lane again. Now, I'm pretty sure the guys are getting dispatching on some type of joke, but whatever. I still have to respond, and better safe than sorry, I guess. 
So I drive down the road, turn onto the gravel road and park my cruiser away from the house and check the perimeter and go up to the front door again. Still no sign of life inside and I knock on the door and announce myself. Officer Barkley with the police department. I'm about to leave and I go to check the door handle out of pure habit and sure as shit, the door opens. I was so startled by the fact that the door opened that my right hand immediately went to my gun on my right side. I announced myself again. Uh, hello? My name's Officer Barkley. I'm from the police department. Uh, come to the front door or I'm going to have to enter, okay? Before entering a house, for officer safety reasons, we always get on the radio. Uh, 10.34 to dispatch. Dispatch, go ahead. Uh, no one appears to be home, but the front door was unlocked. I'm going to make entry and just check the house, okay? It appears to be abandoned, though, so... Do we have any backup available? Uh, 10.34. All units are still on that fatal DUI accident. Do you need one to break or something? Negative. I'll advise. I figured that I didn't need backup breaking from a potential homicide scene for this abandoned house search. I make entry, gun drawn, and I proceed through the first floor, dodging cobwebs and stepping over dead insects and critters. I continue upstairs, through the bedrooms and closets, everywhere a person could be I checked. I work my way back downstairs and check the basement. Uh, it's a pretty small basement, but it's broken in several tiny rooms. One room has a metal door with a padlock on it too. The padlock needs a key to open it, and it's completely rusted shut, covered in cobwebs, and even one big old black spider was guarding that lock, having made its home. But clearly, this lock had been here for years, maybe even decades. I didn't worry too much about it, though, since there was no way anyone was in there due to how rusted this old lock was. Even the keyhole looked corroded and filled with rust and dirt. I eventually just left and advised dispatch no report again. And so, I grab a cup of hot coffee around uh, 0400 hours and catch up with one of the guys from the DUI crash and ask him what the mess of the scene looked like. He told me that I'm lucky I wasn't on that scene. He asked me about the Patch Lane house too and I told him it was pretty fucking creepy but I checked it out and it has to be crossed wire somewhere or something. I felt comfortable telling him that it was creepy since I knew this guy from when my dad was still on the force and he treats me like a daughter. He said that he used to get drop calls all the time there back in the 90s but there was actually a family living there back then. Each time that he got dispatched they were surprised to see him and they let him search the whole house and there were never any problems. Just a, a single mum with her two kids minding their own business really. I asked him what happened to that family and... He said nothing suspicious. They just moved away after about 10 months or so. Definitely less than a year and a few families moved in and out just renting the house. But ever since about the late 90s, nobody's moved in. I asked him if he remembered there being a locked room in the basement. Honestly, just not really knowing what I was expecting as a response. And his eyebrows raised and he said, Uh, you know what? I actually didn't remember until you just asked now. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, the only reason I remember it is because the nice girl that lived there with her kids didn't have a key and couldn't get into the room and was asking me if I knew a local locksmith, but I told her that I didn't really know anyone since any time the cops need in somewhere, we just kind of smashed the lock open. She giggled at that, and I remember she was actually really attractive, and she was a good-looking girl. So... We both just shrugged it off, finding it odd, but moved on with our shift into the early hours with another DUI stop and a domestic violence call from a guy whose wife drank too much and decided it was a good time to confront him for cheating on her for three years. Anyway, so fast forward to Sunday night. I'm back at work and this time the call comes out right at 0300 hours. Dispatch to 1034. Uh, 1034, go ahead. Hey, uh... We have another 911 hang up from the Patch Lane. Are you able to go? Since I was in the middle of eating my lunch, I decided to not even go. Uh, 
Yeah, dispatch. I cleared that house last night and I didn't even see a landline telephone in the house. Stand by. 10.34 to Sergeant Oakley. Uh, this is Oakley. Go ahead. Hey, Sarge. Did you hear this call? Do you need me to go or can we clear it? 10.34. Just drive by. No need to go in if you don't see anything, but at least drive by, okay? <sighs> Received. Show me on route. I was pissed since I didn't get to finish eating, but I did my job and drove down the gravel road again. This time, the front door was wide open though, and I knew for a fact that I shut it closed the night before. At this point, I begin to think a homeless person is inside, which is still trespass, so I call out to dispatch that I have an open door and I'm going to go check it out. I make entry and this time I see someone run around the corner. My gun is drawn since I have no idea what to expect here and I announce myself and run after them. When I turn the corner, it's just the kitchen and the door to the basement. There's no way out. So, I run into the basement and there's nobody fucking down here. Nobody. I get on my radio and ask for backup, but I don't get any response. So, I make my way back up and still nothing on the radio. I finish clearing the house and still can't find the person. And I make my way out to the cruiser and use the cruiser radio and am out of breath at this point. Ah, uh, 10.34 to dispatch. Go ahead. Did, did you hear any of my calls for backup? Uh, negative. 10.34, do you need a unit? Ah, uh, no, 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 no. You can disregard... I just had one subject on the premise, but they're gone. I'm heading back to the station, okay? So, of course, everyone asks me about what happened. and All I can say is that they must have ran out when they saw me. I didn't tell anyone that the direction they ran left them absolutely no way of running outside, mind you. I begin to wonder if I'm going crazy or maybe I've just had too many shifts on or something. I'm off on Tuesday and Wednesday nights. A rookie, remember? So at this point, I have one more night before I can rest. A Monday night shift left me speechless, though. At roll call, everyone jokes about when am I planning to go back to Patch Lane, and I tell them that they can get the call, and I'm done with it. 0300 hours comes around. A dispatch to 1045. A 1045 is my good friend who's been to the house in the 90s. Uh, this is 1045, go. Uh, we got a 911 hang up for Patch Lane again. Sarge gave the okay to just drive by and make sure no one's there. 1045, okay, show me on route. Not even 30 seconds go by and my cell phone beeps that I have a text. It says, hey, want to meet me there? Bastard. Of course I'm not going to say no, so... Yeah, I go. Uh, 10.34 to dispatch. You can add me to 10.45's call. 10.4. So, we show up at the same time, and this time the front door is wide open again. Awesome, I thought. We both clear the first floor, and then the top floor, and make our way into the basement together, and there's nothing. Then, we turn the corner, and I see there's no lock on the metal door anymore. We look at each other and he said, Hey, I thought you said that this was locked. I say, Uh, it was. So, he slowly opens the door and we're hit in the face with the most horrid smell. A smell that I know well. The smell of death. We find the corpse of a young female, bloated and fresh. The body naturally bloats about two or four days after death and traps gases and that's where the odor comes from we call for backup obviously and the medical examiners show up on the scene they process the scene and begin to take the body away i ask them how long the body had been there and they were experts not me and the me guy said between three or four days based on the rigor mortis and liver mortis and a few other medical terms that i probably can't even spell I said that 
there was just no way that that was possible because I was there a day ago and there's no way that that was freshly locked. I mean, the lock was corroded, rusted, covered in cobwebs. Nobody touched it in years. They said, Officer Barkley, that isn't our job to explain. We're just telling you that this body has been laying in that exact position in that room for between three to four days. Tomorrow will be my first night back and honestly, I'm not sure what to expect. I woke up this morning to a blaring ringing coming from my nightstand. I smacked my alarm clock, but it uh, didn't stop the noise. I finally realized with half an eye open that it's actually my phone ringing. I answer. Uh, hello? Barkley, wake the hell up. Chief wants to see you now. Uh... Sergeant Oakley is not the voice that I wanted to hear at 0800 hours this morning. I rolled my ass out of bed and began to get ready to head into the station since I knew it was never a good sign when good old Chief Fox wants you in his office ASAP. Around 0900 hours, I walked into the station in uniform and headed towards Chief Fox's office. I knocked on his door and poked my head around the corner when the chief said, Barkley, come in and shut the door. I shut the door and took a seat. Well, Barkley, you shouldn't be surprised why you're here. You got dispatched to the same fucking house four nights in a row and discover a dead body on the fourth night? <laughs> and this body had been there for at least two of the previous nights? You really fucked up, Barkley, this time. Now, I have some paperwork out of the ass that you need to answer some questions. What the hell? How is he turning this thing on me? I did my job. I followed protocol. I followed my training. And I cleared the house as I was taught. Uh, okay, Chief. Uh, what questions do you have? Well, walk me through the first night. Did you check the windows, the doors? Yeah, I checked the windows, which were all secured and the front door was locked. There were no other doors except the front door, and it's just a really old, small farmhouse. All right. What about the second night? Windows and doors? Chief, I checked the windows and, as my report said, the second night the door was unlocked. I followed protocol and made entry. And tell me about why you didn't check the room in the basement. Well, according to Maryland Bureau, I conducted a person sweep of the home to check for any persons on the premises since the property appeared abandoned. I looked in all areas that a person could potentially hide and when I got to that room... I saw the lock was rusted, corroded, and covered in cobwebs. But there was no way anyone could have hidden in that room and locked themselves inside. I wasn't searching for a crime or illegal substances or anything. I was only legally allowed to search for persons in that residence. I know the fucking law, Barkley. Thanks. Did you try the lock? Well, no. I could see that it wouldn't have opened, though. Did you think to try to call one of your mail officers to try and open the lock? Chief, the reason why I didn't try to open it wasn't because I thought I was too weak. I didn't try to open it because I could tell that it had not been touched in decades. Well, thanks to your expertise in locks and corrosion, this entire case is fucked up thanks to you. Listen, from now on, I'm going to be keeping a close eye on you. Chief, I followed all of our departmental procedures and stayed within the law. If you feel that I handled these calls improperly or something then provide me with the additional training and procedures that would guide me to know how I should have handled it. Nobody likes a smart-ass Barkley. Just go start your shift, okay? You have a lot of follow-ups to do now for this case and can't be doing that shit at night. What an asshole. I knew from the day the city council hired me that he hated me. Yeah, as I said, it's a small town, so the chief tends to do what city council tells him to do. Lucky for me, city council was eager to hire another female officer, but I don't think Fox was on board with their idea. I'm used to the sexism in these small towns, but I tolerate it since my fellow patrol officers for the most part don't share the chief's criticisms. 
I decided to follow up at the medical examiner's office to see what information they had from the autopsy in the crime scene since we didn't seem to have a copy of their report at our station. I called the chief medical examiner too. Hey, uh, it's Officer Barkley from the Patch Lane case. Did you guys finish up the autopsy report? Uh, yeah, actually we did. Ah, oh, okay. I just didn't see a copy here at the station. Can you send it over? Uh, I'm pretty busy right now and plus that's my assistant's job. Alright, well, how about I just swing by and pick it up then? Well, you can do whatever your little heart desires. The chief medical examiner wasn't exactly eager to help, but I grabbed my cruiser keys and headed on over to the lab. The assistant was a young girl, looked fresh out of college, and greeted me with a smile. Uh, hello officer, how can I help you? I asked her for a copy of the ME's report from Patch Lane, and she proceeded to enter some letters into a computer, then hit print. She handed me a, a three-page document, and so I asked... Aren't there more pages than this? She responded. Uh, no. That's it. I found this very odd considering that most medical autopsy reports for a homicide case are well over 20 or 30 pages at least. I took a seat though to look over the report and I guess my confusion and anger showed up on my face since the receptionist asked if there was a problem. As I reviewed the autopsy report... I saw that for the hair color, which was clearly long and blonde, they listed brunette, and for the eye color, they listed undetermined. I wish this was the end of the shit show, but the entire report seemed to be either wrong or just incomplete. The manner of death was listed as homicide, but the cause of death was listed as undetermined. What the hell? Isn't that their job to determine the cause of death? Well, I marched over to the chief medical examiner's office and knocked twice before walking in. Uh, chief, is this just a skeleton report on the Patch Lane incident? I held up the three-page document in my hands to show him. A skeleton report is just a, a basic report cops fill out prior to the end of the shift and then the next day with fresh eyes they'll fill in the gaps. However, with the homicide case and being that this was now over 48 hours later... I didn't understand why they would only have a skeleton report. Nope, that's the finished report, sweetheart. I hate when old creepy men call me sweetheart. Well, why is there no cause of death listed? Because, thanks to you, the body sat locked in a room for three days and left us barely any evidence to work with. Why the hell is everyone blaming me for this? Well, then can you explain why the hair color was wrong? And about half of these items are listed as undetermined. Well, if you think you can do any better, go right ahead. Be my guest. I asked to go and see the body and wanted to make sure that I wasn't just making shit up in my own head. Shockingly, he actually agreed and took me over to the freezer. Again, it's a small town, so the morgue only had about five bodies in the freezer. And I found out Jane Doe from Patch Lane and zipped open the bag. I immediately noticed her blonde hair and I knew that I wasn't crazy. I grabbed some latex gloves and began to go through her pockets to look for identification since clearly the ME's office decided that it was undetermined if she had items in her pockets. I found a receipt from a gas station for 10 gallons of gas priced at $1.12 per gallon. I actually felt jealous of this dead woman, wondering where she found to get gas that cheap. Then, I looked up at the top of the receipt and saw that the date stamp of the 20th of the 10th, 1998 though. Why the hell would she keep a receipt that old? I flipped the receipt over and saw that there was some type of writing, like in pencil on it, but I couldn't make it out. I put the receipt in a baggie and I decided that I was going to send it out to the PA state lab for further testing to see if they could decipher what was written. But the more I looked at her too, I also noticed that she was wearing bleached jeans with a multicolored sweatshirt, like what my mum used to dress me in when I was younger. I left the freezer soon after since I could barely feel my own fingers now and I asked the chief medical examiner if he had copies of their attempts to identify the body, i.e. dental mouldings, fingerprints, DNA tests, etc. He handed over me a stack of some papers and said, good luck. I asked. 
Hey, why are there only six fingerprints? Why didn't you do all ten like normal? He responded. Well, why didn't you check the lock on the door while you were there three days ago? I don't tell you how to do your job, so why the hell are you going to try and tell me how to do mine? Asshole. I decided I was just going to redo her fingerprints since the ones he handed me looked shitty and weren't even complete. He's usually more thorough than this and I have no idea why it feels like I'm the only one trying to solve this case anymore. I fingerprinted all 10 of our Jane Doe's fingers and ran them through my mobile AFIS. It's uh, an automated fingerprint identification system. And I was pleasantly surprised to see that I actually got a hit. So I clicked see more and my screen read, Michelle Klein, date of birth, the 5th of the 7th, 1972. Date of death, uh, the 20th of the 10th, 1998. What the hell? I, uh, I woke up Friday evening groggy with a, a pounding headache. I'm beginning to think that the bottle of wine I finished Thursday night wasn't such a great idea after all. That's the thing with cops, though. When we come across horrible scenes that we just can't rationalize or explain, whether it be murdered children, abusive husbands, finding a 20-year dead body, we all turn to alcohol. Me personally, I turned to a, a nice dark Merlot. I just couldn't stop wondering how the hell that body could have died 20 years ago. It was fresh. I could still smell it. It just made absolutely no sense. I grabbed my keys with my left hand as I wedged my right hand fingers between my duty belt and uniform belt to get my last belt keeper snapped in place before just running out the door to make it to roll call on time. While driving to the station, all I could think about was how there was just no way my mobile AFIS was correct. I decided that as soon as roll call ended that I was going to grab a different mobile AFIS from the back cave. The not-so-creative name that we call the room full of all of our tools and gadgets and weapons. And scan my Jane Doe's fingerprints again. As soon as roll call was over, I ran upstairs and grabbed Jane Doe's fingerprints from the case file. Next, I grabbed one of the newer mobile AFIS devices and scanned Jane Doe's fingerprints. It was running slow, but seemed to be thinking. The screen read, processing three times. Then... After what felt like an eternity, but was probably only three minutes, I got the message. System has timed out. Failed attempt. Weird. This has never happened to me before, so I decided to try it again, and this time I can actually feel my heart start to thud louder and louder as I waited for the results. Processing. Again, processing, and no results found. What the hell? Are you fucking kidding me? This is the response that I'm used to seeing when I scan a suspect's fingerprints who have never been arrested before. I didn't tell anyone about my previous Michelle Klein results because it didn't make any sense to me. I must admit too that I worried something exactly like this would happen and that I would look like the crazy one. Before I could jump on one of the computers to start doing some digging, I heard the tone drop. The tone is the loud high-pitched screaming tone that makes every cop's heart skip a beat. Dispatch to all available units. We just received a call for gunshots fired near the McDonald's. The caller is unsure where the shooting occurred, but heard three gunshots followed by screeching tires and someone yelling. I ran to my cruiser, flipped the switch to turn on my lights and siren, and raced to the scene. We circulated the area for over an hour with no results, and finally, dispatch got back on the air. Dispatch to all units. We just received a call from the hospital that they have a gunshot wound patient and would like an officer to respond. Sergeant Oakley was kind enough to offer the rookie's assistance. And just like that, I spent the entire rest of my night sitting at the hospital waiting for the victim to come out of surgery so that I could finally question him. I spent all the Friday night thinking about our Jane Doe's case and trying to find answers, but the more I thought about the case the more questions I had. 
When I returned to work Saturday, I decided I wanted to return to Batch Lane to try and get some closure to some of my unanswered questions. After everything that happened, I realized it would be best for me to just not go alone, so I texted my friend. A Tim, he's Batch number 1045, who responded last time with me, and asked if he would be willing to head back over to Patch Lane with me under the radar. He agreed, and we both advised Dispatch to hold us out doing foot patrol around the park. This was an area that we had a lot of problems at night with underage drinking and smoking and whatnot. I rolled my cruiser to a stop and shut off the engine. Tim slowly forced himself out of his cruiser, muttering about his bad back. Barkley, what are we even looking for back here? Anything, Tim. I just don't think the ME's office processed the scene properly based on how they handled the body and all. What? What are you talking about? Shit. I didn't tell him about my little visit to the ME's office. Nothing. Uh, let's just start out and do a full sweep of the perimeter, okay? I wasn't really sure what I was even expecting. There was still police tape across the front door with a, a fire red sticker on the seal of the doorway stamped, Do Not Enter. I leaned down to check the door handle to make sure it was locked and as I reached down, I heard a loud shrill scream come from immediately behind me. I jumped up, turned around and shined my flashlight straight ahead and nobody was there. And then I heard a much softer, quieter squeal come from the ground level somewhere. I redirected my light downward and sitting in front of me was a Halloween black cat. <sighs> Holy shit, cat. What the hell are you screaming at me for? Now that she had my attention, she came up to me and wrapped her body around my leg, purring. I proceeded to check the rest of the windows and work my way to the rear of the house, towards Tim. Haley, yes, I named her, followed me and began frantically meowing at me the closer I got to the rear of the house. Her screaming got so bad that I had to throw her some crackers from my pocket just to distract her, and thankfully it worked. I noticed a shadow in the upper level window, but I couldn't make out what it was. I began taking steps backwards to get a better look through the upper level window, all while shining my flashlight upward, but by about my seventh or eighth step back, I felt something hard and sharp whack me in the back of my ankle and brought me to my knees. Tim came running over since this time I was the one doing the yelling and not Haley. He shined his light down to make sure I was okay and thank God there was no blood and I seemed to be fine. I bent over to see what it was that I felt go into my ankle and I felt a, a rusted sharp chunk of metal. It was a, an old root cellar door handle. The root cellars are not that uncommon on these old farms. It was a way for farmers to store their harvest over the long winter months when refrigeration was non-existent. What the hell is that? Tim asked. Uh, it's a, a root cellar door, I told him. We, uh, we need to see what's down there, okay? We opened the door and... I used my ASP baton to wrap all the spider webs around it and clear a path for us. Barkley, you're fucking going first, okay? I shined my light down and began going down one step at a time. I went slowly so as to not fall through one of these old wooden stairs. We walked down what could only be described as a tunnel for only about 10 seconds before we reached a, a small set of stairs. There were about four steps up that led to a smaller hatch, almost like an attic door, one that you had to crawl through without a ladder. I reached up and opened the hatch, and I popped my head up and shined my light around. There was a, a large rug over the hatch opening. Tim helped me push it out of the way, and once we could finally see in the room, I recognized it. It was the room that we found the Jane Doe in. Tim grabbed my arm and convinced me that we needed to leave because this house was still an active crime scene and we just couldn't go waltzing on around inside. But we had finally figured out how the body got in that room in the first place. I knew that I wasn't crazy. There was just no way anyone had touched that lock on the outside. We turned around though and retraced our steps, careful not to disturb anything. Along the way, 
I tried to look for evidence, but it was just too dark. It was an area that would be better examined during the day, that's for sure. We returned to our cruises and calmed our nerves over a long smoke break, despite the fact that I'm not even a smoker. I got home, passed out and went back into work on Sunday. One thing I love about working weekends is that there's no brass at the station when I go into work. However, this day was different. As soon as I walked into the station, I overheard my co-workers talking about some suits that were up in the chief's office. Sergeant Oakley saw me and immediately snapped his fingers at me. Barkley, get over here. Chief got called in today because of a surprise visit from some suits. He wants you in his office immediately. I headed upstairs to the chief's office, a little surprised that the feds were getting involved in this case. I began to wonder if the FBI got involved because of a, a potential serial killer or something. My thoughts were quickly interrupted by Chief Fox though. Barkley, get your ass in here. Oh, the wonderful sound of his voice. Uh, hello Chief, how can I help? Barkley, the Marshals got called in to help with this case. The US Marshals? They usually go after fugitives. Do they think that a fugitive did this to our Jane Doe? Do they think our Jane Doe is a fugitive or something? My mind is going 100 miles per hour this minute and... Chief Fox then told me that I had to sit down with them and answer any and all questions that they had. I took a seat and walked them through my past week explaining the 911 hang-ups and finding the body and all. I wasn't planning to give them any details about the fingerprints, Michelle Klein or the secret door, but they asked me something that sparked my interest. Officer Barkley, uh, are you familiar with the US Marshals Witness Protection Program? conversation with the U.S. Marshals, it uh, left me speechless. It seemed like every time a question was answered, it just created ten more questions. My Jane Doe was in the witness protection program. And why? Why would she risk her life by coming back here? Who wanted her killed? But the U.S. Marshals were extremely professional, polished, and appeared as though they wanted to help. They weren't willing to divulge any specifics or details of why Jane Doe was put into the program or why she may have been killed for that matter. But they did tell me that she was a key witness to a very high profile case years ago involving the ATF. They also admitted that Michelle Klein was in fact her real name. However, they faked her death upon entry of the protection program. Whenever I ran her fingerprints through the AFIS, it triggered an alert in their system and that's how they came to be standing in front of me. But before I could ask any questions, they actually shook my hand and thanked me for my time. And they walked out the door before I could even get a why out of my mouth. Who killed Michelle Klein? Who kept calling 911? What did this poor woman get herself into? Why was there a receipt in her pocket from 20 years ago? I finished up the rest of my shift completing paperwork, which I eventually faxed over to the suits. I went home early Monday morning and only had two glasses of wine before rolling into bed by 500 hours. But don't be mistaken, it's not that I didn't want to drink an entire bottle again, but I was just uh, too tired. On Monday evening, I headed back towards the station for roll call, which started at 1700 hours. Sergeant Oakley read and summarized aloud the prior shift's reports before releasing us to hit the road and all that. But before I can finish racking my cruiser, dispatch calls. A dispatch to 1034. A 1034, go ahead. A 1034, we just got a call from a senior citizen who's currently at a neighbor's house. Uh, she's a, a medical alert customer and oxygen dependent. Her phone lines are currently not working and is requesting to speak with an officer. 1034, show me on route. Although there isn't much for an officer to do on a call such as this, we're obligated to respond if someone calls and requests to see an officer. I drive down the long country road towards the caller and can't help but glance to my right as I parch patch lane sign. I arrive on scene and meet with the sweetest old lady who reminded me very much of my own grandmother in fact. She explained to me that she walked to a neighbor's house and called the phone company about her phones not working but... Just wanted an officer to keep her company until her phones were fixed since she was oxygen dependent. 
She also shared that she has already had more than one fall in her home and used a medical alert. I told her that I was happy to wait with her. She lived in a, an older farmhouse. There are many of those in this area though and had one of the prettiest farmlands that I've seen in a while in fact. She had her garden filled with colourful flowers and cute lawn ornaments throughout. She caught me staring too and said, Oh, yeah, my daughter comes by every week to help me keep my garden looking so pretty. Her husband mows the lawn for me and she tends to the flowers. I was shocked to see the local phone company drive down the gravel road within 30 minutes of my arrival. I went outside to greet the technician and explain the problem. He introduced himself as Tom and asked me where the box was located. As quick as I could repeat the question in my head, I heard the older woman yell from the porch, it's behind the shed. I followed Tom behind the shed for about 20 yards away as I saw a large three foot square pole sticking out of the ground. But Tom walked over to it and began reaching on his belt for some tools and I asked, what's that? Uh, this is the box that connects a telephone line uh, as well as a neighbor's line to the central telephone system. I'm going to see if there's some problems with the wires making the connections and stuff. He uh, attempted to open the hinge, but there was no luck. These old things go months or maybe even years without opening and take a little TLC to open if you get my drift. Ah, here we go. The front face opened after just a little elbow grease was put into it. I saw several wires and some labels next to the wires containing a series of numbers. So, explain to me what's going on here, I asked. Uh, sure. Well, these boxes were put here way before your time. They had to install these when uh, landlines first became a thing, in fact. You see these wires and the numbers after them? They show to which address each wire is associated. I noticed a loose wire hanging from the bottom with no label. And this one appeared to have a female attachment on the end. I asked, And what's that wire made to connect to? Oh, that's there so we can plug our phones into it and make phone calls and test the lines and all that. Wait, what? You can carry a phone in your pocket, plug it in and make a call from a box? Tom laughed and explained. Well, it isn't exactly that simple. You need a certain type of phone, but yeah, I guess it's kind of like that. What phone number would show up when you called someone from a box? Well... Whichever neighbor's line you selected up here. As he motioned to the labels and switches, it was then that I had my light bulb moment. What if my 911 hangups at Patch Lane were being done at one of those boxes? I asked. So, hypothetically, if, uh, if a house had no electricity, no telephone, could it still show up as the origin phone call if someone called from a box? Tom paused for a moment to think about it and responded uh i guess so yeah i mean that's possible i suppose as long as the telephone line hasn't been reassigned to another person i guess so tom finished up his work and was able to get the phones working again i left the scene within the hour and it was still light outside i decided to go back to patch lane in the daylight to see if i could find one of those landline poles I arrived on the scene and began walking throughout the acreage, and after about 20 minutes, I found it. I leaned over and wrapped my two fingers inside the front panel and pulled. The door opened with ease, much unlike the last box that I just watched Tom open, which meant that somebody had opened this box recently. But who? As I started to head back towards my cruiser, I heard screaming. <sighs> fucking Haley again. I turned around and saw Haley sitting by the front porch. But this time, she looked to be in pain. She was holding a front paw in the air and kept licking at it, screaming in pain. I got closer to her and saw that her paw looked incredibly swollen. Now, I'm an animal lover, so I decided to wrap her in an old uniform shirt that I had in my trunk and set her in my cruiser. I grabbed my phone from my front vest pocket and googled local veterinarians. I was pretty damn surprised to see my family's old vet was showing us still open and in business. We had a black lab growing up that I swear was the most intelligent dog ever. Dr. Damires was just down the road and open until 8pm or 2000 hours as I interpreted it. 
I glanced at my watch and saw that it was already 1940 hours, so I rushed down the road to the vet. Dr. Damier immediately took us in and began examining her paw. To be honest, I couldn't believe this guy was still alive, let alone still working. I remember as him being old, even when I was a kid. I mean, he had to be in his 80s by now. My dad used to always take our dog to him and I remember he would call Dr. Damier as the mayor because he knew everyone in this town and knew everything about them. And for as much as my dog hated the vet, I swear my dad loved going there to just shoot the shit with Dr. Damier. So tell me, where did you find this cat officer? Ah, uh, just down at Patch Lane at the abandoned farmhouse. She was sitting on the front porch just crying in pain and I couldn't just leave her there. Ah, uh, yes. I haven't heard from Patch Lane in quite a while. Ah, oh, are you familiar with that house? I asked. Well, I don't know if I would say that. I just remember the stories that circulated the town way back when. He stopped to write down some notes in the chart and he looked up and said, That was a beautiful farm once, you know. I remember taking care of the cows on the old Wentz farm when the goods lived there. Did you know the guy that lived there after the goods passed? Oh, I never knew him. I only heard many stories. What stories? Well, that the fellow was a jack of all trades, you could say. He dipped his hands into just about every illegal scheme you could think of. I heard rumors that he had ties to the mafia, in fact. But the guy was blonde-haired and blue-eyed and yet supposedly was Italian. Now you explain that to me, officer. I never did understand it, but I suspect he was giving something or providing something to them. Just a very odd character, if you ask me. I never heard about the owner of Patch Lane until just now. Well, you wouldn't happen to know where he is now, would you? I asked. Ah, oh, he left town quite a few years ago. Never did see him again, in fact. Ah, oh, well. Anywho, here's some penicillin that you're going to have to give to Haley for the next few days. This will help clear up the abscess to make sure this infection doesn't get any worse, and if it does get worse, just call my office, okay? Wait, what the hell? I'm going to have to give her medicine? So now I have a cat? I am more of a dog person, but I also can't stomach the idea of dropping her off at the local shelter either. On my way home, I stopped at a local mart and picked up a litter box, some cat litter and cat food. At least cats are a lower maintenance and more independent than dogs, I suppose. Haley decided to snuggle up next to me for the night, and I'll admit that it was actually the best I'd slept in months. I woke up Tuesday morning and decided to make it a productive day, despite the fact that it's my day off from work and I was completely exhausted. I began to think of who would have more information on Patch Lane or Michelle Klein. All of my thoughts came back to the same person, my dad. I mean, he was on the force back in the 90s. Hell, he was on the force even back in the 80s and the 70s. So, I drove over to his house and pulled into the driveway. I saw the rose bush in bloom in front of the house and it instantly reminded me of my mum. She uh, actually passed away a few years back, but every time I go to my dad's, I find pieces of her just everywhere, such as a rose bush that she planted or something else. I welcomed myself inside and was greeted with a huge bear hug. After feeding me and fueling me with his famous super secret recipe coffee, he sat down. Dad, have you ever been to the house in Patch Lane? Oh, wow. Yeah, actually, I have. Many, many years ago. Really? What were you there for? Well, the ATF needed a couple of uniformed officers to assist them with gathering evidence for a case. They busted the owner of that place for smuggling in illegal guns, I think, and he had them stored in a shed on the farm. What? I've been researching this place for over a week, and I've never heard of an ATF raid. Well, that's because it was confidential. We never wrote a police report on the incident. It was solely documented on the federal level, and they were very good about keeping it out of the media. We didn't have those, uh, the space phone things back then, so... It was much easier to just keep this under wrap and all. Do you know what happened to the owner? Who was he? Uh, his name was, uh... Was it... John? No, 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 wait, uh... Joseph. 
Yeah, Joseph, that was it. Joseph um, Mueller, I think. It was similar to Miller, but not quite Miller. And what happened to him? Right, well, uh, he had an inside mole with the police department and caught wind of the raid, apparently. He flew the coop, and I never really got an update since then. I began to wonder why Tim just didn't tell me any of this. But Dad, uh, I've been dispatched to Patch Lane several times with Tim, and he didn't tell me any of this. Do you know why he wouldn't tell me about it? Well, Tim didn't join the department until about... Uh, 1997 or maybe 1998 and this all happened around 1995 about two years before then well that made me feel a little better i must admit that i felt guilty for insinuating that i was questioning tim my dad began to ask me questions about my own calls to patch lane but i made the dash to the front door and told him that i had to get going because of Haley, and simply told him that i had taken in a stray who was still healing and all I hadn't heard back from the PA state lab yet, so I called them to get an update of what was written on the back of the receipt that I found in Michelle's pocket. My receptionist answered the phone. State Forensics Department. Hello, this is Officer Barkley following up on the case number 2018. I wanted to check the status of my evidence. The receptionist transferred me. A male answered. Uh, hello, Officer Barkley. Sorry, we've been so busy and I didn't get a chance to call you sooner. We were successful in extracting the writing on the back of the receipt that you provided us, though. And it read L34-R16-L8. What does that even read? Well, I can't say for certain what this means, but uh, in my personal opinion, this definitely looks like uh, a combination to a safe or something. I became obsessed with trying to figure out where a safe could possibly be on Patch Lane. I woke up early Tuesday morning and threw some food in a bowl for Haley before racing out of my house. But don't worry Haley, mum will be home later, I said. She meowed goodbye in response, brushed along my leg and trotted over to the couch to curl up and wait for my return. It's, it's just so damn hard to leave her now. She's filled a void in my heart that I didn't even knew existed. Anyway, I headed over to my dad's. I didn't call him ahead of time since he's just down the road and I stop in all the time anyway. As I'm pulling up, I saw Tim's truck parked in my dad's driveway. Not very surprised since they're good friends and today is Tim's day off as well. So they just tend to catch up on Tuesdays or Wednesdays over a cigar on the back deck and stuff. I was actually really glad Tim was there because I actually had some more questions that I wanted to run by him as well. My dad greeted me with his famous bear hug and Tim gave me a nod of the head and smiled. Hey, how's it going? Hey, I'm actually really glad that both of you guys are here. I actually wanted to ask you about Patch Lane. Tim chimed in. Ah, oh, see what I'm talking about? Your girl is obsessed with this case now. The chip off the old block, am I right? My dad laughed. Ah, oh, I remember those days of obsessing over cases. I gotta say... Retirement, it's treated me well. I welcome myself back into the conversation. Okay, well, maybe there's a reason to be obsessed, though. I just talked to the state's forensic lab, and it looks like Michelle had written a code to a safe on the back of that receipt that she had in her pocket. I think that there's a safe somewhere in Patch Lane, and it could have some answers for me. Tim took a long inhale of his cigar, held it, and slowly released. <sighs> You're going to make me go back there, aren't you? I flashed him a smile and offered. Well, I could go alone. Tim agreed and my dad laughed at him and remarked. Yeah, she does that shit to me too, Tim. Good luck with that. I added. Tim, I also want to ask you about the 911 hangups you used to respond to back when you were a rookie. What else do you remember about the tenant? Tim thought for a moment and then replied, Well, uh, she was a, a pretty young girl. She had two very young children. Neither could talk yet, so I bet they were under two. She looked young herself too. I would suspect that she was maybe around 20 years old. Just had that, uh, that baby face, you know? Anywho, 
She was very curious about the house and the locked door in the basement. Most people hated when the cops showed up, but she always seemed, uh, I don't know, relieved. She would mention how big that the house was and how she always felt like someone was watching her. Even the tenants after her made similar comments too, and I always chalked it up to being the history of that Wentz farm, you know? Tim, is there any chance that the woman we found in that basement was the same girl that lived there? Uh, I don't know. Why would it be? I always thought that she moved somewhere else, because right after she left, a new tenant came in. I guess I don't know exactly what happened to her, though. Do you remember her name? Oh, jeez. Um, I'm awful with names. Uh, I'll never forget her face, but I can't remember names very well. You know that. That's why I immediately write every person's name down that I interview. I can't even check anywhere since I never took a report for checking a house. Well, could her name have been Michelle Klein? Honestly, I don't know. It could have, but I have no idea. I mean, it was 20 years ago. I turned to my dad. Dad, what do you know about the tenants of that house in the late 90s? He looked nervously down at his cigar and took a short puff. Well, um, I remember all of the tenants were, um, similar. What do you mean? They, like, um, look similar. Dad, this is important. If you've got something to say, just tell me what you're trying to spit out. He took a deep breath. Uh, well, all the tenants were young, attractive women. They were mostly blonde from out of town. The type of girls your mother would not have liked me stopping to talk to at the grocery store if you catch my drift. Wait, are you saying that you think that they were prostitutes? Oh, no. No, I just mean that they were young and pretty and kind of ditzy, you know? I wasn't sure what to make of this information, but I let Tim finish his cigar before we headed into the station. We were scheduled off for Tuesday, but... Given this new information, I requested and was granted to come in and work overtime to follow up. I remembered that Tim used to go to the beach and had come back with old coins and whatnot that he would find using his metal detector and all. I asked him if he could bring his metal detector to Patch Lane with him this evening to help us find this safe. After we broke up from roll call, we immediately headed to Patch Lane. The scene was done being processed, so we walked through the front door and... We went up to the master bedroom and tried every floorboard and every inch of the wall, looking for where a safe could be hidden. And we were completely unsuccessful. We mutually decided to try the basement before the rest of the house, though. We worked our way into the room where we found Michelle's body, and there are some scenes you just won't forget, and that was definitely one of them. Her body was purple, swollen, and just unrecognizable as human. The only way I even identified her as a young woman was based on the long blonde hair and the clothing she had on. Anyway, Tim ran his metal detector along the cement wall and we heard beeping. Tim continued to move it along to the left and then there was some more rapid beeping. We looked at each other for a moment before we dropped his metal detector and we grabbed at the wall. I don't know what we were even grabbing at but we kept feeling along the wall. As I pushed along the wall... A block moved. I grabbed my knife from my pocket and Tim grabbed his. We both shoved our knives along the cement brick and eased it from the wall. And there it was. The safe. It was an old-fashioned turndial lock, like the kind that I used to have in my high school locker. But drawing on my memory, I cleared the lock before trying the combination and I spun it to the left, stopping at 34, spun it two times to the right, stopping at 16, spun it back to the left and stopped at 8. And there was a click. I went to open the door, Tim's eyes and mine locked on the safe, and then I heard another click. But this wasn't like the unlocking of the safe. This was familiar. It was the cocking of a revolver. I turned around and was faced with the barrel of a gun. Well, well, well. You pigs just can't stay away from my house, can you? He had blonde hair, although the grey was taking over, and he also had piercing blue eyes. You're as bad as that bitch who couldn't keep her mouth shut. You know, I let her live here because she appeared cute and dumb. 
Her curiosity, though, was what got her killed. Just like what I'm going to do to you two. The problem with facing a gun is that, no matter how fast I could grab my gun, he would have been able to pull his trigger faster. However, there are other options, so I slowly walked towards our killer, hands in the air, leveled with my shoulders and asked, You're Joseph, aren't you? Yeah, and you're dead. As he finished his sentence, uh, my nose was barely touching the barrel of his gun. I grabbed the barrel, twisting it to his right, making a full 360 degree circle and I heard his pointed finger snap as it got tangled on the trigger and broke. I had his gun and pointed it right back at him. Get on the fucking ground now! He slowly raised his hands in the air and got on his right knee, and then his left. Tim ran behind Joseph and placed him in handcuffs. Once the scene was under control, we called for backup. As officers arrived on the scene, so did the suits. Two suits from earlier in the week came down and Tim and I recounted the evening's events. It was at this point that I realized I still didn't get to see what was inside the safe. I walked over and opened the door and I grabbed a handful of papers and pulled them out. They were photographs. Tim instantly said, That's her. That was the girl. Like I said, I'll never forget a face just names. The suits looked at him and said, that's Michelle Klein, your body and our witness. I took a deep inhale and released it with a long sigh. Now can you please tell us what the hell went on here? The suits looked at each other and the older one nodded his head. All right, so your Mr. Joseph Mueller here was into some deep stuff. Most predominantly, he ran illegal guns and sold them to some big names, including the Mafia. The ATF thought that they got everything during their raid years ago, but there are so many hidden passages, tunnels, and root cellars throughout this property and land that he just kept hiding them somewhere new. Trust us, if you knew about the tunnels and the passages that you're literally standing on right now, you'd have nightmares for years. The suit took a sip of his coffee and continued. He actually used the tenants as a cover-up and targeted tenants who he thought wouldn't ask any questions and would be fine with sending checks addressed as cash to a P.O. box as their monthly rent checks. What he didn't expect was for Michelle Klein to start asking questions and go digging through this house. She stumbled across one of his root cellars where he stored guns and called the feds immediately. She didn't know if she could trust the local police at that point and went straight to the ATF. The ATF contacted us and said that they knew Mueller and knew that if he found out what she knew that she'd be as good as dead. So they sent her to us to protect her. A part of her protection meant that she needed to fake her death so that Mueller wouldn't be suspicious and go looking for her. She refused initially but when we explained to her that her children's lives were at risk, she agreed. He looked towards the safe and continued. It looks like she used this safe here to store old family photographs and their birth certificates as proof of their existence. We told her that she had to leave all of this behind and couldn't take any evidence with her of her previous life or her children. This all happened on October 20th, 1998 and it looks like she wrote down the safe code on the first piece of paper that she found and kept it after all these years. We received notification about two weeks ago that her son was diagnosed with cancer. Fucking cancer. The kid was only 22 years old and had a brain tumor. She kept on telling us that she wanted to go see him and we explained to her why it just wasn't possible and we even told her that he probably wouldn't have recognized her anyway. She probably wanted to grab these photographs to show him to prove that she was actually his mother and jog his memory. And when she was here, Joseph must have seen her from one of his tree stands and wanted to silence her. She was one of the only witnesses willing to go forward with the testimony and we could just never catch him after all these years. I responded. Well, I hope this entire case can be closed now. The suits responded. Yeah, I don't think you should be getting any more 911 hang-ups from that house, that's for sure. I processed what they just said and asked. Yeah, but wait... Who was the one making those phone calls then? They responded, We, uh, we can't disclose that information, but you can think of them as good Samaritans who had eyes everywhere and wanted to see justice done. We headed back to the station where 
I started the never-ending paperwork process. And now that we were more secluded, I grabbed one of the suits and decided to tell him about my experiences at the medical examiner's office. I began to think that he was involved somehow and it was something they needed to know. He stopped me and said, Well, this is actually something the ME wanted to talk to you himself about. Hold on a second. The suit came back with the ME and he extended his hand to shake mine. I was confused by the gesture, but shook his hand. Officer Barkley, I just wanted to say what a fantastic job you did on this case. I also wanted to apologize in person for how I acted and how I handled this case. I actually received an anonymous threat that if I performed an autopsy or did anything at all with the body, my family was going to be killed. They, uh, they even knew my daughter's school and her schedule and everything. I'm... I'm really sorry about everything and I was just afraid to go to the authorities out of fear for my family and all. I'm really glad to see though that you stuck to your guns and saw this case through. But dispatch interrupted. Dispatch to 1034? 1034, go ahead. Are you able to respond to a 911 hang up? Affirmative. What's the address? I woke up early afternoon to a purring on my chest. It was Haley. This cat has become the love of my life since we found each other about a week ago. However, I know that I could do without my new vibrating alarm clock, that's for sure. I gave her a few scratches before guiding her off my chest and I glanced at the clock and saw that it was already 1300 hours. So, I got out of bed, showered, and slowly began preparing to go in for work that night. I put on my uniform, geared up, and headed out the door. The roll call was pretty short and sweet since we were getting busy and Sergeant Oakley wanted bodies on the road as soon as possible. But right before breaking, Sergeant Oakley made sure to add, And Barkley, try not to have another shitstorm follow you, yeah? Yeah, Sarge. I was going to try and make a shitstorm, but now that you told me not to, I guess I won't. I might be one of the very few females in the department, but most of the guys appreciate my thick skin and sarcasm. I was in the middle of a, a conversation when dispatch interrupted me. Dispatch to 1034? 1034, go ahead. Are you able to respond to a 911 hang-up? Affirmative. What's the address? Old Schoolhouse Road. Show me on route. I racked my cruiser and headed towards the house. Every time someone calls 911 and hangs up, we're obligated to respond if dispatch is unable to call back and speak with someone. As a rookie, I'm quite familiar with responding to these hang-ups. A little too familiar if you ask me. Anyway, I turned down the gravel road, kicking up dust in my Taurus's path. I stopped a few yards away from the old log cabin and approached quietly. To my surprise, there was an elderly woman sitting in a floral chair just watching television. I didn't see anyone else in the home, so I approached and knocked. Uh, this is Officer Barkley with the police department. Can you please come to the front door? The woman slowly raised herself from her chair and held onto a walker. She came to the front door and greeted me. Hello there, officer. Uh, is something wrong? Uh, Ma'am, everything's alright. We just received the 911 hang-up from this residence. She responded. Oh, yes, uh, everything is just fine here, officer. It was probably just my husband. I became more alert and instantly asked. Where is your husband? I need to go and check to make sure that he's alright then. She shrugged her shoulders and pointed towards the fireplace. Well, he's right there, officer. I looked to where she was pointing, but, but there was nobody there. I became concerned. Uh, ma'am, I don't see your husband. Can you please tell me what room he's in? She slowly walked over to the mantel and pointed to the center. He's here, officer. She pointed to an urn. Oh, I see him now. I'm so sorry for your loss. I wasn't sure what the response to that was going to be, but... I knew it was important to not mislead her and pretend that he was still alive. Yes, well, thank you. Saying sorry isn't such an odd tradition, don't you think? I mean, I know you aren't the reason he died. Anyway, 
I'm sorry that you came out for that. Ever since Samuel passed a few months ago, he's just been messing with the wires. He turns the lights on and off, and I keep getting phone calls saying that they're returning my call, but I never called them. I guess it's his way of just letting me know that he's still here with me, right? I don't believe in the paranormal, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't freak me out. I gave the woman a heartfelt smile and reached out my hand. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't get to formally introduce myself. Uh, I'm Sarah Barkley. Please feel free to call me Sarah. Oh, oh hi Sarah. I'm Rose. It's very nice to meet you. Again, I'm so sorry that you got called out here for nothing. I'm sure you have much more important places to be. No, uh, it's alright. Uh, this is an important call to me. However, per my department's protocol, I do need to check your home to make sure that there isn't anyone else in here who, who could have made the call, right? Is that okay? Uh, sure, of course. Uh, I understand. I'll just sit out here. I've been home all day, though. There certainly isn't anyone here but me. She settled back into her chair and continued watching her television as if I wasn't even there. I started to check the first floor of the cabin. I cleared the kitchen, then the family room, and made my way into the master bedroom. I made sure to check every closet and everywhere that a person could physically fit to hide. First floor was clear, so I headed to the basement. I saw an old workbench covered in different machines and tools used for loading ammunition by the looks of it. I know these items quite well since it's a hobby my dad has had for years too. Everything was covered in dust and looked as though loading ammunition was a, an old hobby of Samuel's. I could see that he had an assortment of empty clean shells lined up on a tray as if he was preparing to load them. He had a, a very fine antique loading press that I know would make my dad jealous in fact. I wondered if Rose knew the value of these antiques. As I made my way down to his workbench, I was impressed with his organization and tidiness. It was all set up, ready for him to return to work at any moment. I glanced towards the corner to the cellar door where I saw his jacket hanging on a single hook. I began to wonder if Rose has been just waiting for him to come home after all these months. I made my way around to the laundry room and finally headed back upstairs after clearing the basement, wedging my duty belt between the stair railing and the chairlift that Rose had installed. I made my way upstairs and walked through the family room to another set of stairs leading to a second floor loft. I slowly walked up the stairs and opened the door to the loft room. I could smell the stale air from a room that clearly has not been used in years. I checked the closet and under the bed and there was nothing. Right as I went to leave, I noticed a, a small cubby door in the corner behind the door. Again, I had to check anywhere that a person could possibly hide, so I opened the cubby door with my left hand, holding my gun in my right. The storage space was pitch black, and I grabbed my flashlight and shined it in. The cubby space was nearly empty, except for an old lamp, a, a wooden sled, and an old trunk with brass locks. But when I looked at the old trunk... Every hair on the back of my neck stood up and goosebumps covered my arms. My intuition has saved my life many times, so I've learned to just follow it at this point. I slowly crawled through the cubby, making my way towards the trunk, and I opened the lid and I found a trunk full of uh, various items, and no person hiding in there. I released a, an audible sigh of relief and I decided to drag this trunk out of the cubby, Especially since I knew that Rose was unable to walk up those stairs and I thought that maybe this would be something that she would like to know about. I hollered over the loft railing. Hey, uh, Rose? There's an old trunk in this cubby hole up here. Did you know that it was up here? Rose replied. Uh, what? What trunk? I decided to carry it down to her to let her look through it. I set it down at her feet and opened it. I could see it much clearer now that we were in the light and there were old newspaper clippings, uh, photographs, uh, old clothing. But one photograph in particular caught Rose's eye. She leaned over and picked up the photograph, caressing the edges and she actually began to cry and my immediate response was to comfort her. Oh, Rose, uh, are you okay? What's wrong? She sat and cried for a few moments and when she was able to answer she said 
Well, uh, it's a photograph of my granddaughter, and I not only lost her once, uh, I lost her twice. Sometimes the pain is just, uh, it's just too much to bear. I asked, what do you mean that you lost her twice? Rose responded, don't you know, honey? My granddaughter, she was Michelle Klein, the woman the police found in the Patch Lane house. I couldn't control my facial expressions as my jaw dropped open. Wait, Michelle Klein was your granddaughter? I knew that I was repeating what she said, but I was uh, still processing this piece of information. Uh, yeah, you look surprised. Were you one of the officers who found her? Oh, Rose, uh, yeah, I was. Um, I'm really sorry for your loss. I guess I always thought that she was more of a transient and just had no idea that she had family left in the area. Well, I think I am the only family left here. Michelle's children went to live with her aunt and my daughter down in Maryland after we believed that she died 20 years ago. I knew Michelle's children were in Maryland because the US Marshals told me that they were going to drive down personally to notify her children and tell them how their mother was in the witness protection program all these years. I had just so many questions though for Rose now, but I tried to pace myself. What was your relationship with Michelle like? Well, she was less like a granddaughter and more like a daughter to me really. I love Michelle's mother very much. Uh, she is my daughter, but uh, she has her flaws, that's for sure. She became heavily involved with the Catholic Church when she married Michelle's father so, when Michelle came home and told them that she was pregnant and going to be raising a child alone, they kicked her out of their house, and I don't think it was even six months before they ended up moving out west to be closer to Alan's family. Alan? Oh, yeah, that's uh, Michelle's father. Oh, sorry. So, what did Michelle do when they kicked her out then? She had nowhere to go. Samuel and I took her in and helped her through her pregnancy. It wasn't too long after the first one was born, too, that she was pregnant again. We let her stay through her second pregnancy as well, and then the, uh, the accident happened. What accident? Well, uh, Michelle was driving down the road to work. Uh, she was a waitress, and uh, she got hit head-on by a, a drunk driver. She was uh, seven months pregnant, and we didn't know if either of them was going to make it. I think that that night must have just taken years off of my life. I cringed as the scene of the accident ran through my mind. Wow, that must have been really terrifying. Yes, uh, it was, Rose replied. As I'm sure you can figure out, they both made it. They performed an emergency cesarean section and Michelle suffered a, a severe brain injury, but with therapy and the right doctors, she made a full recovery. I was dying to know how Michelle ended up at Patch Lane, though, and so I asked. So, when did she move out of your home? Oh, uh, let's see, uh, probably about, uh, I'd say ten months after the accident. I know it wasn't a full year yet. Uh, she ended up starting her own business and made more than twice what she was making as a waitress. Being that this was such a small town, everyone knows who owns each local business, and I was surprised to hear that Michelle started her own business. I mean, I had never heard of a business. Uh, what business did she start? Rose's eyes widened slightly, and she inhaled deeply. Well, now, uh, that's an interesting story that might take us a while. I was so engrossed in Rose's information that I leaned in closer. Well, I have some time. Alright, well, after Michelle's accident, she didn't feel the same. She started experiencing uh, strange things that no one could explain. I wasn't sure where Rose was going with this. You mean, like, medically? No, uh, not like that. Uh, she started having uh, thoughts, memories like thoughts. They weren't real memories and had never happened to her. She would be confused on why she just randomly had that thought, and then within a day's notice, her vision would come true. This conversation was not going where I thought it was. However, I was still intrigued, and I could tell Rose felt embarrassed because she knew how it all sounded. 
But she continued. I know how this must all sound, and if it weren't for seeing it with my own eyes, I wouldn't have believed it either. I couldn't help myself, and I asked, What exactly did you see with your own eyes? Oh, I'll never forget her first vision. We were all in the family room just playing cards and unwinding since she just got home from work. Out of nowhere, she just started crying. At first, I thought it was hormones since it wasn't long after her second child. She said that she didn't know why she was crying, but quickly, she started rocking back and forth in her seat. And she just kept repeating, no, no, this isn't happening, this isn't real. I started crying just at the sight of her, and Samuel had no idea whether he should console her or sit back. He just kind of stared in disbelief. I held her for nearly 20 minutes until she could finally speak. She said that someone that she loved was dead. I assured her everything was okay, but she just kept saying, someone's dead. At this point, I had goosebumps up my arms. So, what happened? Well, we finally got her to calm down and we just put her to bed. It wasn't even 7am when we woke up to the phone ringing and Samuel answered it and I'll never forget his face. I've never seen just so much pain in his eyes at that very moment. He slowly lowered the phone and grabbed my hand and I asked him what was wrong and he told me that Mary, Michelle's sister, overdosed last night. I had no words and no response. Suddenly, everything around me just felt more vivid. The rain outside sounded like it was knocking on the window to come inside. I didn't even notice that it was raining until now. I stared at Rose's face and could see every line on her forehead, every wrinkle on her cheek, and I noticed my breathing slowed. I don't even believe in this stuff, but I felt almost frozen in time as I absorbed everything that Rose was telling me. Rose took a sip of her glass of water and didn't let the silence bother her. She continued. And ever since then, they only got clearer and more precise. I mean, it eventually got to the point where she could tell us who was calling before we even picked up the phone. It became just normal to us, and we treated it like a game. This gift really changed her when we were walking through the park one evening, too. Michelle felt a, a heaviness on her chest that she couldn't shake. I was concerned that... She was having a heart attack or something because of how she was acting. But she somehow knew that this wasn't medical and said that she was feeling a spirit connecting to her. Rose closed her eyes and relived the moment. Michelle just had me so worried. I held on to her and after a few minutes passed, she opened her eyes and began crying hysterically. She told me that a little girl was buried there she would not let it go and we eventually called the police out. But there was a nice officer working that evening who listened to every word Michelle told him and never rolled his eyes once. And you know, I think he had something happen in his own life that he was a believer long before we called him. He decided to get a shovel and start digging on his own before calling for backup, given the circumstances and all. It took him about 15 minutes but eventually he found a trash bag. He stopped digging and didn't even open the bag before calling for backup and started wrapping police tape around the park. I felt like a child during story time and I just couldn't stop asking questions. So, was there a body? What was in the bag? Rose let out a sigh. Oh yes, there was a body of a young girl. And that's a sight that I'll never forget. The police questioned Michelle, but... It didn't take them long to rule out her as a suspect and they just slowly started using her to help with other cases. I tried to draw all of the pieces of information together and figure out how it could all possibly relate to Patch Lane and I asked, So how did Michelle eventually end up living at Patch Lane? Well, Samuel and I didn't want Michelle to move out. We were concerned for her and the kids' safety and we really loved having them here but... Michelle felt it was important to be a, an independent mother for her, those children and she started searching for a safe but affordable home. 
She looked mostly in this area so that we could still help her with watching the kids and whatnot, but one day she was at the corner store grabbing some milk and saw a paper taped to the bulletin board for a house for rent. It was surprisingly affordable and not far from our cabin, so she left the store and drove straight to the house on Patch Lane. She became immediately drawn to the house, like a moth to a flame or something. As soon as she got home, she called the number on the paper and said that she would have to take it. And I'm sure that you can imagine my surprise when I got home that evening and she told me that she was moving into the old house on Patch Lane. Everyone around here knows the stories of that old farm, but somehow those stories just never got to Michelle. What happened after she moved into Patch Lane? Moving into that house was a, a blessing and a curse. She finally gained the independence that she so desperately sought, but it came at a price. The visions just became overwhelming. She barely slept at night, in fact. The visions became so intense that the line between reality and visions was just slowly fading for her. She always talked about hearing a spirit tell her that she needed to check out the basement. She found that old door with the lock on it and even called Samuel over one day and asked him to help her remove the lock. Now, you know, we're old-fashioned here and we don't go snooping into other people's business. Samuel told Michelle not to go snooping and even told her to mind her own business. He refused to help her open that lock and she didn't know how to open it herself without cutting it with a bolt cutter or something, which wasn't an option since she didn't want the landlord to find out at all. I remembered at this point when I first approached Patch Lane that I still saw the rusty lock on the door, so there was no way that she could have gotten into that basement room unless she found the underground tunnel. I asked. So when did she eventually get into that room? Oddly enough, she wasn't the one that found the root cellar passage. It was her kids. One day, they were just playing in the yard and started jumping on something. But the loud clank of the metal got Michelle's attention and she ran over to find the root cellar door. She put the kids inside and went back to the root cellar and she opened the door and walked down the stairs and through the tunnel. She came to the hatch and she opened it. She found herself in that locked room in the basement. She called me immediately after she found that room too and I remember it clear as day. A single tear made its way down Rose's cheek, making a path straight over each wrinkle. Rose added, As soon as Michelle got into that room, she had the worst vision yet. She, uh, she saw her own death. The rain turned into a monsoon. I heard thunder rumble in the distance, followed by lightning less than two seconds apart. I was taking a sip of water and trying to imagine what it would be like to envision my own death. Before I could even ask any further questions, Rose continued. And that was really when things got bad too. Michelle found things in that room that she just shouldn't have and she wanted to go to the police, but for some reason, she just didn't know if she could trust them. Instead, she went straight into the feds and, well, you know where it went from there. I had a thought rush into my head. Rose, do you know who the father of Michelle's children are? Rose nodded her head and said, uh, Yeah, I do. Who? I asked. Rose took a deep breath. He was a, a cook at the restaurant Michelle worked at. He would force himself on her and she just didn't say no. That job was the only thing that she had for quite some time and she worried that if she said anything that she would end up being the one in trouble. In a town this small, there just weren't that many jobs for her to choose from. My heart ached for Michelle. I can't believe that she had to go through that. Oh Rose, I'm so sorry. That must have been so hard for her. All we could do was try to help her. She even started trusting men again and started dating someone right around the time that she moved to Patch Lane, but she was always very secretive about his identity. All she told us was that he was a good man and would be a great father to her kids, if things went in that direction, that is. So, Dispatch interrupted me. Dispatch to all units, please respond to River Road for flash flooding. 
We just received six calls coming in that the river has riven past the road, and barricades need to be put up. 10.45. Show me on route. Of course, Tim is one of the first ones to respond. I mean, he is one of the most active officers that we have. Shortly later, I heard the rest jump on the radio. At 10.39, on my way. 10.52, on route. I joined. At 10.34... You can show me leaving the old schoolhouse and I'll be on route. I turn to Rose. Rose, I I just have so many more questions for you. Would you mind if I stopped back over tomorrow night or something? Rose gently threw both hands in the air. Oh, of course. You're welcome to come back here anytime you want, Sarah. I hope you don't think that I'm just some crazy old lady, though. I assured Rose that I believed everything that she told me and would love to come by tomorrow and just talk. She walked me to the door and handed me a hot mug of coffee. You can bring me the mug back tomorrow when you see me, okay? I thanked Rose and headed down the river road to start damage control. It took almost 15 minutes to get there because of how quickly the roads flooded. I arrived on scene and we were all able to barricade the flooded road to prevent any vehicles from falling victim to the rising waters and all that. I was on scene of various flooding incidences until the end of my shift. I was beyond soaking wet, and the first thing I did when I got home was strip naked and take a hot shower. Haley's new thing was to sit on the toilet and watch me the entire time that I shower. At first, I, I thought that it was creepy, but then I started to think that she was just concerned that I was drowning every time I showered because she just looked so concerned as she just sat there. I got out of the shower and gave Haley one of her bedtime treats. I laid in bed scratching her until we just both fell asleep eventually. I woke up to more ringing and my alarm just wouldn't shut off and then I realized that it was my phone. I answered in a groggy voice. Ah, uh, hello? Hey Sarah, it's dad. Uh, I'm sorry, did, did I just wake you? Uh, yeah, but it's fine. Is everything alright? Uh, yeah, 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 I'm fine. But, uh, the basement flooded pretty bad here. I was hoping you could stop by here for a few hours. Before you go back to work tonight, just to help me move all of these boxes upstairs. I never say no to my dad. I'm a, a daddy's girl and we've always had each other's back. Uh, of course, dad, uh. I'll be right over, okay? Um, you want me to grab some lunch for us? Uh, pizza? You read my mind, sweetie. I pulled up to my dad's house and carried the pizza inside. He came upstairs and we each scoffed down a couple of slices before heading downstairs to tackle this disaster. He had already done a lot of the heavy lifting by himself, which, of course, I didn't like. Dad, you should have waited until I got here to do all of this. Don't worry, I still saved a lot for you. Can you help me carry up all these cardboard boxes in this corner? Just uh, set them all in the family room, okay? I began carrying the boxes up one by one. I came across one box labeled Teresa and just couldn't help myself but to open it. It was old photographs and clothing of my mum's. My dad saw me going through the photographs and came over and took some from my hands. He sat down and quietly admitted. Ah. <sighs> I miss her so damn much, you know. Do you realize how much you look like her? Whenever someone tells me that I look like my mother, it's the best compliment that I could ever receive. I don't care about being called pretty or gorgeous, but when I'm told that I look like her, I just can't help but smile. I know, Dad. I miss her too. It's hard to believe that it's been over 20 years now. We talked about old memories and we agreed that we should probably go visit her grave later today to make sure the flooding didn't damage the cemetery or the flowers that we keep around her site. I gathered myself and started carrying more boxes back upstairs. By about the fourth trip up, one of the boxes was so saturated that the bottom broke and items spilled all over the stairs. I started picking up old uniform shirts of my dad's and some sports memorabilia that he had tucked away. When I picked up one of the uniform shirts, a photograph fell out. I picked it up to see if it was another photograph of my mum, and to my surprise, it wasn't. It was a photograph of me when I was about five years old or so, I'd say, standing next to a woman that uh, looked very familiar, 
at a carnival or a fair or something. Within the two seconds my brain was processing who it was in the photograph, my dad came over and snatched the photograph from my hand. What are you doing? He yelled. This was not like my dad at all. I was really confused. Dad, I just... I looked again at the photograph that he was holding in his hand. At the wires in my brain, they finally connected. I knew who the woman was in the picture with me. It... It was Michelle Klein. Why was there a photograph of Michelle just standing there with me? But this made just no sense and I opened my mouth but nothing came out. I'm not sure if it was shock or utter confusion but my dad saw it in my eyes and as soon as he locked with them he knew that I had figured it out. How about we go sit down upstairs and talk Sarah? I didn't want to sit down though. I felt a whirlwind of just different emotions rush through my body and I began to feel dizzy in fact. I grabbed onto the old wooden stair railing and it caught my balance. Dad, what the hell is going on? Sarah, let's just go sit down and talk, okay? I didn't want to go and sit down but my body gave me no choice. We went upstairs and I sat down on the couch. My dad walked into the kitchen and I heard a pop. He walked back out with a bottle of Merlot in one hand and two glasses in the other. He sat down and poured each of us a glass. You know, this was always your mother's favorite one, he said with a shaky tone. I looked up at him and saw that he had a tear rolling down his cheek, past his mouth and dripped onto his hand. I needed answers and I needed them now though, so I asked. Dad, why do you have that photograph? He took a long sip of his glass of wine and began his explanation. <sighs> Where do I even begin? Look, I met Michelle many years ago, only a couple of months after your mum passed. I was on duty and got a call for service in the park. Michelle had, uh, she'd uh, found something there. I stopped him. I spoke with Michelle's grandmother, Rose, and she told me about Michelle's gift. My dad's eyebrows raised and he slowly nodded his head. Ah, so you know already. Well, Michelle sensed that there was a young girl buried in the park and sure enough, there was. We were all so impressed with her gift that we began using her for help for unresolved cases. Michelle and I, uh, we got to spend a, a lot of time together working those cases and we became very good friends. One thing led to another and... We, uh, we became romantically involved. My dad glanced down and shook his head. I was, I was so happy and yet I just felt so guilty and ashamed for being happy so soon after your mother passed. We agreed that it would be best to not tell anyone about us. Whenever we wanted some normalcy, we took you kids to the amusement park in the city and we just told you that we were friends. And... Uh, that's where that photograph was taken. Why didn't you tell me about this when I started asking you about, uh, about Patch Lane and about Michelle Klein? My tone grew louder as I began to become angry that my dad, my best friend, had lied to me. Well, I didn't lie, Sarah. I told you I'd been to Patch Lane for the ATF raid, which was true. I'd been there before I ever met Michelle. I just left out the fact that I'd been there additional times. He paused and then continued. And you never actually asked me about Michelle. You were here talking to Tim about her. When I heard you say her name, my heart stopped, I must admit. I thought she died 20 years ago. And that's the God honest truth, I tell you. First your mum and then Michelle. I just kind of gave up hope after I lost Michelle. Well, at least when I thought that I had lost her. When you asked me about the tenants in that house, I just did my best to describe her. But like I said, she had a reputation around town and she wasn't the kind of girl our family and friends would have want me seeing. Of course, the reputation was entirely unfounded and I just, I wished I could have helped her out of it. I could feel the anger stir inside my gut. 
How the hell can you say that that wasn't lying to me? You're right, okay? By admitting the truth, I lied. And I'm really sorry, okay? I didn't tell you when you were little because of how soon your mum had passed. You barely even understood what death was back then. And as time went on, there was just no need to bring up the past. So then, what did happen to Michelle, Dad? Well, moving into that house was a, a horrible mistake for her. That house was haunted by its past and its present too. Her gift became more of a curse and I always worried that it would be her downfall in the end. I mean, she knew that she was destined to die in that house. Nobody should ever have to experience what she did. When she found all of the guns that were hidden in the tunnel and in that room, she called me immediately. She wanted to report it to the police, but I remember what happened last time that happened. There was a mole in the department and they gave Joseph a heads up before the ATF raid so he had time to get out of there. He eventually just found new hidden root cellars and tunnels and rooms to hide this stuff in all over the farmland. And so I gave her the phone number of a friend of mine in the ATF and I'm not sure what happened after that. But somehow she ended up in witness protection. And Tim, did he know all of this and lie to me too? I was pretty much screaming by this point. What? Tim? No, he didn't know anything. He's straight as an arrow, Sarah. You know that. He's there when you need him, follows the rules and never sticks his nose where it shouldn't be. He still doesn't know any of this. I could feel the smoke pouring from my ears. I chugged the rest of my wine and just stormed out the door. My dad began to call out for me to wait, but I just kept going. I felt so hurt and so betrayed that he lied to me after all these years. I sped home and immediately opened a new bottle of Raceling, and I opted for a white this time because I was in the mood for chugging, not sipping. I didn't know how to cope with this stress, but I knew how to drink, that's for sure. I quickly emailed Sergeant Oakley and told him that I was going to use some unscheduled vacation time because of some personal family matters that I had to deal with. Sergeant Oakley may be tough, but he's a firm believer that if you aren't 100% mentally at work, then you need to take a vacation day because you're only putting your life and your co-workers' lives at risk by being there. I grabbed my glass of racing and went into the bathroom to draw a bath. I ran the water, added some bubbles, and tested the water with my right toe first. Perfect. I stripped down and slid into the tub closing my eyes as I slid under the water. I could hear the rain outside of my bathroom window just beating down rhythmically. It's been raining here for days now, and while I hate the flooding and the horror that comes with it, man, do I love the sound of rain. Wait a minute. Shit. I just remembered that I promised Rose that I would go back to see her tonight. I leaned over the tub and texted Tim to swing by. I figured I could ask him to return her mug and let her know that I'd be back in a few days. He said that he would stop by after roll call and I hopped out of the tub, put on my favourite comfiest sweatpants and curled up on the couch with Haley. I began to feel like she was the only one that I could really trust and never has betrayed me. I heard a knock at the door and jumped off my couch to let Tim in. I opened the door and was startled when it wasn't Tim standing there. There was a, a girl about my age standing in front of me. She had long blonde hair and I must admit that she was really pretty. She looked straight at me and said, Sarah Barkley? I was a bit on edge so I hesitantly answered, Uh, yes? Uh, hi. Uh, I know you don't know me but I'm Samantha. You're working a case involving my mother, Michelle Klein? I scooped my jaw off the floor and said the first words that I could get out. Oh, uh, uh, hi. Thankfully, Samantha didn't let my awkwardness interrupt her. She continued. So, I'm here because I think that there's something you need to know. I finally could formulate a real sentence and offered her to come inside. She accepted and I asked. So, what am I supposed to know? Well, when the marshal spoke to my brother and I, they said the reason our mum came out from hiding was because she found out that my brother had brain cancer and was dying. I responded. 
Yeah, that, that's true. Uh, they told me the same thing. Yeah, but see, that's the problem. I was confused. My brother, he doesn't have brain cancer. He's perfectly fine. He never had cancer. He doesn't even take medication for anything. He's perfectly healthy. My mind began racing at this point. Who said that she had cancer? Did Michelle tell the marshals or did they tell her? Why? Who would lie about that? I verbalized some of my questions. Do you know who told her that he had brain cancer? Well, yeah, kind of. The marshals told me that they were the ones who told her because they received notification. They said that they constantly kept checks on my brother and just to make sure that we weren't in any danger or anything. When I asked them for specifics, they said that they would have to get back and check their client case file and check who signed off on the supplemental report. When they went to check it though, it was gone. My gut tells me that I can trust the two marshals I spoke to, but now I, I don't know who falsely notified them that my brother had cancer. I began to realize that somebody intentionally lured Michelle out of hiding and knew that if Joseph Mueller saw her, that he would definitely kill her. Listen, Samantha, I absolutely want to look into this further, but I just used some vacation time and took off these next few days. I'm happy to help you next week, though. Samantha nodded her head in disappointment. Yeah, yeah, I know. I'm sorry I even bothered you at home. I got your address from your chief. I was honestly pretty surprised that he gave it out, but he said you wouldn't mind me stopping by. Fucking Chief Fox. No surprise there, right? Samantha continued. I just wanted to offer my help though, that's all. I appreciated the offer and asked. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, how can I get a hold of you if I need you? Samantha gave me her phone number and her hotel address where she had been staying in town. I reassured her. I'll look into this, I promise. And I'll let you know what I find, okay? I just remembered about Rose's cup that I still had. Oh, and uh, I have your great-grandmother's coffee mug. Uh, it's a bit of a long story, but if you see her while you're in town, could you give this back to her for me? Samantha looked at me confused and asked, Which great-grandmother are you referring to? Rose, your mum's grandma. She used to live with you when you were little, remember? Samantha looked like she just saw a ghost and told me. Ah, uh, Officer Berkeley, Grandma Rose passed away a few years ago. I'm going to need more than just one vacation day by the looks of things. I'll update all of you when I return to work. I was starting to question my own sanity. I mean, there's no way that I was sitting in that cabin talking to a ghost, right? I even held the coffee mug in my hand to prove it. There was just no polite way of asking the question that I had pounding in my head like a hammer on a nail. But I decided to ask Samantha anyway. Well, are you sure that your grandma is dead? I couldn't tell if Samantha was offended or just surprised by my question. She thought about it for a moment and said, Well, yeah, I mean, I think so. Why would my aunt lie to me about that? That was her mother after all. I asked for clarification. So this aunt of yours would be your mother's aunt too, right? So she's actually your great aunt. Samantha nodded her head in agreement. Yeah, I just never have called her or thought of her as a great aunt since she's pretty young because of how old my mum was when she had me. I pressed her for more details. Do you remember exactly what your aunt told you? Samantha's glance moved to the upper right of the room while she was deep in thought. Her eyes came back down and met mine as she answered. Yeah, I remember when she got the phone call. She said it was the police department and they notified her that Grandma Rose had passed. My aunt was so upset because when she asked for the body and what next steps that she could take, they told her that because there was no family left in the area that it took them a long time to contact next of kin. At which point, Grandma Rose had already been cremated. It broke my aunt's heart and 
It seemed like every time she tried to call the station to ask questions, they told her everything was gone and that there was just no need for her to come up for anything. I began to wonder if the mole had something to do with this. Uh, Samantha, I don't know what's going on here, but your grandma Rose is very much still alive. Samantha began to tear up and before she broke down, I stopped her and said, Here, let me write down your address for you and you can go see her yourself. She'll be so much happier that you're bringing this mug back than me, that's for sure. I wrote down the address, handed the mug to Samantha and the puzzle pieces began coming together. What if the mole in the department is behind this all? But why? I thought about all of the phone complications Rowan was having and blaming Samuel for them. Why didn't Rose try to call any of her family? Did she ever try? Did someone cross her phone wire so that any outgoing calls would be screened first or something? If this is the case, it has to be related to whoever has the ability to make all of those 911 hangups and knows the phone system inside and out. I walked into my kitchen to grab another glass of wine and realized that there's only one thing that could calm my mind more than wine. My Aunt Maggie. I decided to take a weekend getaway to Aunt Maggie's. She's been there for me all my life and if anyone could help me sort through all of this, it's her. I always feel better after speaking with her and spending time on her secluded farm. She just has a, a way of putting things into perspective. But between her classic farmhouse, vibrant garden and acres of nothing but fields, it's the perfect cocktail for relaxation. So, I grabbed my phone and dialed her number. The sweet voice that I know so well answered the phone with an almost singing greeting. Hello? Hey Aunt Maggie. Hi, honey. How are you? Hey, uh, I was wondering, uh, can I come and spend the weekend with you? I need a mini vacay right now. Sure, you know that you're always welcome here. Thanks, uh, do you mind if I bring Haley with me? Uh, Haley? Who's Haley? Is this a new friend? Uh, sorry, um, no, uh, it's my cat that I recently adopted. Oh, uh, I didn't know you got a cat. Your dad didn't mention your cat when we last spoke. Anyway, I'm looking forward to meeting her. Make sure you drive safely and I'll see you soon, okay? I grabbed some clothes from the closet and my toiletries from my bathroom. The packing took about 10 minutes and I then collected Haley's food, bowls, bed, litter box and supplies and it took me longer to pack her stuff than mine. Once I had everything ready though, I loaded the bags into the car, grabbed Holly put her in her new carrier and headed for Aunt Maggie's. I immediately began to feel my stress level decline as I pulled away from my driveway. After a short drive, I arrived at Aunt Maggie's home and it was beautiful, large, a two-story farmhouse with a wraparound porch. She took pride in her home and spent countless hours tending to the colorful flower beds that lined the long front walk and driveway. An avid gardener and home cook her vegetable beds were green and lush. Clearly, all the recent rain had helped her crops too. Since I arrived later in the day too, I was not surprised to see her sitting on the front porch, working a crossword puzzle and enjoying a cool glass of lemonade. I knew she was waiting for me to arrive and that made me feel uh, really loved. Once she saw me, she stood up and placed her crossword book in a basket beside the front door and walked down the front stairs to meet me. I must admit it was uh, really nice to see her and I knew Haley was ready to get out of the carrier too. She had been meowing for the last 15 minutes of the ride and I guess she was just afraid of the unknown. I certainly can relate to that, that's for sure. Hi Sarah, how was your trip? Yeah, uh, it was good. No traffic which was nice. I think I made the drive just between storms too. Oh, that's good. Yeah, I was... I was a little worried that you'd have to take an alternate route with all the storm damage in the area. I then remembered just how bad the storm damage was in some of the areas. Aunt Maggie's place luckily seemed to escape the brunt of the storm. So did you have any storm damage? Looks like you got pretty lucky to me. Oh, I'm fine. There was a little water in the basement and garage, but uh, nothing that I couldn't handle. It sounds like your new friend would like to get out of the car too, so how about we take her inside and I'll make you some dinner. 
I have some stuffed chicken breasts in the oven and green beans on the stove. As I walked through the front door, I could smell that chicken and the freshly baked bread resting on the kitchen island and the faint traces of homemade peach pie too. And oh man, how wonderful it was to be here. It reminded me of all the times that I would stay with Aunt Maggie as a young child when my dad was working double shifts. Sometimes I, I really did miss those days. Sarah, do you mind setting the table for us? I just need to pull the chicken out of the oven and rinse the green beans. Then everything should be ready to eat, okay? Uh, sure, yeah, I can handle that. Are the dishes still in the same cupboard? Yeah, uh, center section, lower shelf. The silverware is on the drawer beside the refrigerator, though. I immediately set the table and helped Aunt Maggie carry the heavy pots to the table. She really made a lot of food for just the two of us, but... I guess after making such large meals for so many years, she just couldn't break the habit. But we sat and began to load our plates, and everything smelled just so delicious and tasted even better. I didn't realize until the first bite just how much I missed my aunt's cooking. Everything is wonderful. I forgot how amazing your stuffed chicken breast tastes. Well, thank you, but I can't take all the credit. The butcher shop always gives me the best cuts of meats and breasts, that makes the biggest difference when you're cooking. We enjoyed the dinner and I ate so much food that I could hardly move. I helped Aunt Maggie clear the table, load the dishwasher and put away the leftovers and we then retired to the front porch to enjoy a glass of racing and the cool evening air too. So, how's work? Are you busy? She asked. Oh, you have no idea. Between all the storm damage calls and the murder case that I caught last week... Things have been crazy. I'll be very happy once things return to normal and it finally stops raining. Oh, so are you on the Patch Lane murder case that I saw on the news? I'm glad you caught the guy. That jerk was no good from the word go. I guess his luck just finally ran out, hey? Since Aunt Maggie had grown up and lived in my area years ago, I thought she may be able to share some details about the Patch Lane farm. Hey, did you know Joseph Mueller? Uh, yeah, I did. Uh, well, sort of. I never met him, but he used to call the insurance company where I worked all the time to report property damages on the farm. We handled and processed the insurance claims for his farm insurance provider since they didn't have a local office in the area. They found that it was more feasible to sub out all the claim work, and he always seemed to have a, a problem with his property especially after a storm or renovation project. At one time, he called and reported that someone had dug up one of his fields and he lost a, a $10,000 crop of corn. We don't handle crop damage claims, but he wouldn't stop calling. He claimed that he had property damage as well, so the firm sent a field technician to investigate. Turned out that he had dug up the field himself and had accidentally hit an unmarked utility line that sparked and partially burned the field. He was... Actually lucky that the utility company didn't press charges or sue him for the repair costs. But we had a tough supervisor at the time and he finally intervened and convinced the insurance company to terminate his coverage based on the fraudulent claim. My aunt went on to tell me that Joseph had a girlfriend working at the insurance firm and she had tried to reinstate his coverage without a supervisor's authorization but was fired when they discovered the policy change. Aunt Maggie had piqued my interest at this point though. It was amazing that she knew all of this. Hey, you wouldn't happen to remember her name, would you? Uh, yeah, I do actually. Her name was Betty Ann, but everyone just called her Beat. I think her married name was Smith or Smooth or something like that. I'm not sure if she changed it after her divorce, though. Uh, I lost track of her after she left the company. How ironic. Chief Fox's secretary was named Betty Ann, and he called her Beatbox. I couldn't help but laugh. What's so funny? Aunt Maggie asked. Well, uh, Chief Fox's secretary is named Betty Ann, and sometimes he calls her Beatbox. We would always laugh about it since we didn't think that Chief Fox knew what a Beatbox even was. Wait a minute. I'll bet your Beatbox is the same one that I worked with all those years ago. There can't be too many women in the town called Beat, right? And if it's the same person, uh, she'd be close to my age, I'd say, or maybe a few years older than I am. I haven't seen her in years, but she used to have the prettiest chestnut brown hair. 
She always wore it in a, an old updo style with a black ribbon tied around it. She always thought that she looked like a movie starlet, but if you ask me, she looked more like a cartoon character. I couldn't believe it. The chief secretary had the same hairstyle? It had to be the same person. I pulled out my phone and began to scroll through my photos from our last apartment holiday party. I knew that I had a photo of her and I wanted to see if Aunt Maggie recognized her. I found one and enlarged the portion with beatbox. Does this look like her? Aunt Maggie studied the photo and said, Uh, yeah, that's her. She's gained a lot of weight though and you can tell that she colors her hair now I think. But that definitely looks like her. I began to wonder and talk to myself out loud. But how could Chief Fox not know this? Why would he hire her then? And to my surprise, Aunt Maggie actually responded to my rhetorical question. Well, I can't say for certain, but I wouldn't be surprised if Beat was made to sign a confidentiality agreement to not disclose her termination. Plus, it was much easier back then to just simply leave things off of your resume and whatnot. And now you can't get away with that because of all the technology and ways to check. My mind began to race. Could Beatbox be the mole in the department? Was the chief aware or, heaven forbid, could he be a part of the leak? Chief was a straight shooter though. Granted, a, a sexist straight shooter, but nonetheless he was a fervent supporter of the justice system. So I really didn't think that he could be involved. But... I had to be sure. I mean, people's lives are at risk here. We stayed outside just long enough to capture the sunset, and Aunt Maggie and I then moved inside and reclined on the sofa. She always watched the nightly news at 10pm, so I knew that she wouldn't want to miss it. I didn't want to worry her about beatbox, so I changed the conversation to a lighter topic. Haley, That wonderful little purr monster had won my aunt's heart too and seemed totally at home, just nestled on my aunt's wingback chair. You know, your little friend here is a real angel. I'm actually really glad that you have her to keep you company. Yeah, she is. Uh, I just, I never knew I could love her as much as I do. I wasn't looking for a cat, but now I just can't imagine life without her. I glanced at the mantel clock, and it was almost time for the nightly news. I decided to refill our wine glasses and grab some popcorn from the kitchen. Aunt Maggie, she loved popcorn, so I knew that she would enjoy sharing a bowl with me. I settled on the couch and covered my legs with a throw. I didn't have to call Haley because she leapt from the back of the chair and landed squarely on my lap. I swear this cat has a blanket radar. Aunt Maggie laughed and commented on Haley's agility. It clearly her paw felt much better and it was healing. The news began promptly at 10pm and the lead-off story was no shocker. More rain in the forecast. Aunt Maggie was the first to comment. Oh, I swear, if it rains any more than this, I'm going to have to build an ark. I agreed and realized that I was probably in for a rough return to work. We would probably be inundated with calls for flooded basements, trapped elderly and... A stupid motorist calls for individuals who believe their vehicles could double as boats when the water rose too high for driving. Seriously, the amount of money the department spends rescuing these people could be better used for new gear and additional offices. Anyway, the next stories talked about the weather disruption to the local baseball league game schedule and landslides in the local community. Apparently, the league supervisors were discussing a shortened season and wanted public feedback at the next meeting. The heavy rains had caused local hillsides to collapse, which created lengthy traffic detours along busy highways. After a short commercial break, the news anchor continued with the top stories. And, to my surprise, it was an update to the Patch Lane murder case. The news presenter said that earlier today, accused murderer Joseph Mueller posted bail of a million dollars and walked out of the local county jail... His trial is set to begin sometime in early 2019. What the hell? That bastard was supposed to be remanded until trial, based on flight risk. Who posted the bail and what the hell was that judge thinking? I immediately texted Tim, did you see that Mueller posted bail? Instead of texting, Tim was calling me. 
Hey, uh, listen, I know that you're on vacation, but we have a huge problem. Mueller flew the coop, and the marshals are worried that he's actually after you. They're looking for him now, but there's no telling where he's gone. They want your location so that they can send back up. This guy has a score to settle with you. Tim, why did the judge give him bail? This is a capital murder case. Well, apparently, his lawyer argued that he has advanced prostate cancer and requires pain management and chemotherapy treatment that cannot be provided in the prison. The judge bought the argument and set bail at a million dollars, and no one thought that he'd be able to post it, but within 30 minutes, he was walking out of the doors. Well, who posted the bail? Well, that's another problem. The paperwork is missing, and the camera above the bail office was, well, wasn't functioning. We have no visual of who posted that bail. If you ask me, it looks like Mr. Mueller had some help. The marshals were at the station all day following up on the case, and it seems that log records are not correct and just key pieces of evidence are missing from the lockup. Needless to say, it was a, a real shitstorm, and the chief is not happy. The suits were all over his ass, and they're threatening to pull rank and ask the state attorney general to intervene. Barkley, I think that we have a mole in the department, and I'm worried about you. Tim, uh, I have to go, okay? It looks like the marshals are calling me. Barkley, be careful, okay? Watch your back. He didn't tell me anything that I didn't already know. I answered the incoming call and it was one of the marshals that I had met during the investigation. Barkley, uh, we need to meet you now, okay? What is your location? Mueller's in the wind and we have no solid leads to his whereabouts. Ah, uh, I'm visiting family one county over. I can meet you. No, uh, we'll come to you. Stay at your location. Uh, we'll be there in 20 minutes. True to his word, Marshal Compton and a few of his cavalry arrived within 20 minutes and it had begun to rain. He rushed to the front door and Aunt Maggie let him inside. Clearly, she was worried about me. Hi there, uh, I'm Maggie, Sarah's aunt. Hello ma'am, uh, I'm Marshal Compton with the US Marshals. I'm here to talk with Officer Barkley. As I walked around the corner, Marshal Compton redirected his conversation to me. Is there somewhere where we can speak privately? We can talk here in the living room. My aunt can stay as I believe you'll be interested in some information that she shared with me too. A protocol dictates that we talk privately, but if you feel her information has a direct bearing on the investigation, we'll allow her to stay. Yeah, you'll want to hear what she has to say, trust me. Aunt Maggie offered the marshals a glass of lemonade and we walked to the living room. We sat down and the marshals began to talk. We were recently alerted to the inconsistencies with the Patch Lane paperwork by the district attorney's office and began to fear that there may be a, a saboteur in the department. We began to identify individuals with access to evidence and who would have the ability to alter documentation and all that. But since your department is small, we had a handful of suspects and we began to evaluate each one. Some of those individuals were quickly ruled out. Others remained under investigation until we could clear them. When we were at the station last week, I noticed the chief secretary, Miss Rhodes, pulled out the station parking lot in a, a newer Audi R8. I'm not the best with cars, but I did remember a lot of the guys drooled over her new car when she got it a year ago. Uh, yeah, that car that's made for someone like 40 years younger than her, right? I know what you're talking about, but what's the significance? The marshal continued. Well, it sparked my curiosity, so I began to suspect that there was more to Miss Rhodes. I began to investigate her financials because there is absolutely no way that she could afford that car on a police secretary salary. Hell, I can't even afford that car and my wife is a lawyer. Clearly, she has some other income that she's not reporting on her annual tax returns. We also took a good look at her credit report, and the woman has a serious shopping issue. Marshal Compton paused for a moment and then resumed. Listen, we have reason to believe that she's somehow involved with the Michelle Klein murder, but we're uncertain as to the extent of her involvement. We're waiting for a court order to dig deeper on the financials. Aunt Maggie then repeated her story of Beat's prior work experience and subsequent dismissal to the Marshals. 
They ask questions, some that Aunt Maggie could answer and others she couldn't. One lingering question, though, that no one could answer was why Beat would lure Michelle out of witness protection now. I mean, it made no sense. And, as quick as I could finish my thought, I heard a gunshot outside the window. I grabbed Haley, handed her to my Aunt Maggie, and directed her. Aunt Maggie, take Haley and hide in the closet, okay? I immediately pulled my Glock 43 from my concealed holster and ran outside with the marshals toward the sound of the gunfire. Marshal Compton slammed the front porch door open with his polished shoe and ran outside. It was pouring down rain again, and I walked outside to find the other marshals on top of a woman just restraining her over near the tree line. She was screaming in a, a shrill cry, you bastards, you need to die too. Once the handcuffs were on, I placed my Glock back into my waistband holster. It was beat. But thank God she missed the window and fired into the side of the house. She must have followed the marshals here and approached through the woods or something and then made an attempt at my life. As the marshals got her to her feet, she saw me standing there and she took one look at me and... I felt coldness. She said in a, a much slower, lower voice than her previous cry, Don't you think this is over, Barkley? The marshals loaded her into an unmarked Ford Explorer and began driving her back to the station. Marshal Compton offered to give me a ride back to the station to listen in on the questioning. I figured my little vacay was dead and gone at this point anyway, so I took him up on this offer and got into his car. On the way back to the station, I told him everything that Rose and Samantha had told me. I told him about the visions Michelle had and I told him about how someone lied about Rose's death. I was interrupted by Marshal Compton's radio when someone announced they found Joseph Mueller and had him in custody. I sunk deeper into the car seat, relieved to hear that news. We arrived at the station and I headed towards our video surveillance room while Marshal Compton made a ride down the hallway towards the interrogation room. Since we're just a small town department, we can't afford the fancy one-way mirrors and several interrogation rooms. We have one room and we have a video camera set up in the corner. If anyone wants to listen to the interrogation, they have to do it from this video surveillance room, which is really more like a closet. I saw Marshal Compton sit down. All right, Betty Ann, you know why we're here. Why did you try to shoot Officer Barkley? Beat just sat there, staring at the corner of her shoe with a frown on her face. No response. Marshal Compton continued. Okay, let's talk about something else then. We know that you're involved with Joseph, but why the hell would you care about killing Michelle? I mean, that's his problem, right? She wasn't your problem. She knew nothing about your existence. It had nothing to do with you. He got Beat's attention now. What do you mean it had nothing to do with me? Joseph is my other half. Because of that bitch, he had to go into seclusion and hide all of these years. The only reason he didn't leave the area was because of me. He loves me. So, why now? Why did you lure her out of hiding? We know it was you that sent the memo to the marshals telling them that her son had cancer. He was bluffing, but it worked. Yeah, I did it now because I didn't have much time left. Joseph has stage 4 cancer. She paused to wipe her nose and hold her tears back. And his dying wish was to see Michelle dead. She ruined his life and she is the reason that we couldn't truly be together. Marshall Compton pressed her further. So why did you have to lie about Michelle's grandmother's death then? How the hell did you pull this one off? I, I tried a while ago to lure Michelle out of hiding. I thought her grandmother's death would have brought her back, but I was wrong. It was done, though. I had to stick to the story. Beat smirked at the thought of how impressed she was with herself. But Joseph and I have connections, and we were able to make Rose's phone only make outgoing calls to this area code. All of her family lived far away, so it was actually pretty easy to do, too. She would just get error messages on her phone if she tried. It was all making sense now. This could explain the phone complications that Rose was having. 
Marshal Compton began thinking aloud. So then, that's why you faked Michelle's son's brain tumor. To lure her out of hiding? Beat made a full-blown grin at this point. Yes, I did. And it worked damn well, too. Marshal Compton jotted down some notes on his notepad and flipped back and forth between pages, making sure that he covered as much as possible. He asked, So why would you make those 911 hang-ups from Patch Lane? How did that benefit you if Officer Barkley found the body? Beat's grin washed away and anger took over. I never made any 911 calls. You think I'm an idiot? Nobody was supposed to find that body. Officer Barkley ruined this. That bitch just doesn't know when to stop. Why are you angry at Officer Barkley for responding there? Well, she's the reason I'm here, isn't she? I was going to let Michelle rot away in that locked room in the basement after Joseph got his final wish and I killed her. Officer Barkley is the one who somehow still found that body, and then she went snooping over at Rose's too. She just can't keep her damn nose out of my business. Marshal Compton fed off of her response. And what business is that? Pete slowly inhaled and released with a sigh. <sighs> you know that. The ATF knows that. Not that it matters much now. But Joseph ran guns for <sighs> very important people. He made good money doing it too and spoiled me with the cash. We took care of each other. What kind of important people? Beat's eyebrows raised and her expression became serious. You would have to kill me yourself before I ever thought about giving you the names of those people. Anything you do to me, they would do way worse. Marshal Compton finished his questioning and they made their arrangements to transfer Beat to the local jail. I couldn't stop wondering, though, who made those 911 hang-ups that led me to the patch lane? Hell, who made the call that led me to Rose? Marshal Compton made his way back to me and reached out his hand. Officer Barkley, on behalf of the U.S. Marshals, uh, I'd just like to thank you for a job well done. If you ever think about going federal, you should call me. Or if, uh, if you ever think about maybe a, a cup of coffee, you can call me for that too. He handed me his business card with a personal cell phone number on the back. As hard as I tried, I couldn't stop myself from blushing. Ah, uh, thank you, Marshal. Uh, I'll keep that in mind. As flattered as I was, my mind switched gears completely and I thought of Aunt Maggie and Haley. I swung by my house, showered, changed, and I threw a couple of my favorite white wines into a bag.